Thank you. I'll press on. Uh, the next item of business is a statement by Paul Wheelhouse on draft Scottish energy strategy. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, and so there will be no interventions or interruptions. Uh, Minister, ten minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the success and well-being of Scotland's people, communities, businesses and public mm -hmm. services are underpinned by the supply of reliable energy. Affordable energy provision is a prerequisite for our quality of life, good health and for ensuring we have a productive, competitive economy. Our energy sector already provides high quality jobs and a vibrant climate for innovation. In established sectors like oil and gas, where skills and expertise gained through more than 40 years experience of operating in the North Sea will prove invaluable in the uh, engineering and innovation challenges in creating the energy system of the future. And in new renewable energy sectors such as offshore wind, wave and tidal energy alongside grid scale battery and pumped hydro storage. I'm announcing today to members that the Scottish Government has now published a consultation on our draft Scottish energy strategy, setting out a vision for the future of energy in Scotland between now and 2050. Our climate ambitions underpin all of the choices laid out in the draft strategy and have in turn been uh, determined by our commitments under the 2009 Climate Change Act. The strategy has been developed in concert with and as a companion to the draft climate change plan laid in Parliament and presented in this chamber by the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform last week. As we stand here today, the task to decarbonise our electricity production has been largely achieved. The equivalent of 59.4% of Scotland's gross electricity consumption is now met by renewable energy, and we are well on our way to meeting the 2020 target of 100%, albeit UK government policy changes have made our progress more challenging. Our options in terms of the scale of supply of energy have substantially broadened in recent years. Consumers can now generate energy for their own needs from solar panels or a wind turbine, for example. Scotland has been at the forefront of the drive for community and locally owned renewables, with over 15,000 locally and community owned renewable energy sites in Scotland, with an installed capacity of 595 megawatts, surpassing our target of 500 megawatts five years early. By the end of 2015, we had seen the largest annual increase in renewable heat output since measurement began, up by more than 1,100 gigawatt hours in a single year. In 2015, Scotland produced enough heat from renewable sources to meet between 5.3 and 5.6% of non-electrical heat demand. We can all take pride in such successes. Uh, however, it's clear that more progress will be required, particularly in the supply of low-carbon heat and transport, if we are to remain on track uh, to meet our ambitious climate change goals. To maintain momentum, a new 2030 all-energy renewables target is proposed in our energy strategy, setting an ambitious challenge to deliver the equivalent of half of Scotland's energy requirements for heat, transport and electricity from renewable energy sources. I hope that members will welcome this landmark uh, proposal, given the support shown for such an ambition last month in this chamber during the debate on support for Scotland's renewable sector. Our renewable sector is facing an uncertain future with unwelcome cuts to UK government support schemes, jeopardising a very strong investment pipeline and the strong Scottish supply chain across a range of renewable technologies. Onshore wind, for example, is now a mature technology and a number of issues need to be addressed, including the approach to repowering existing wind farms coming to the end of their planning consent or extending the life of sites where appropriate to do so. In our accompanying onshore wind policy statement, we set out our approach to these important matters in more detail. This draft energy strategy calls on UK ministers to do more to restore confidence in the sector in light of UK's slide down the investment attractiveness uh, league table and for industry itself to continue to deliver the cost reductions required to ensure low carbon energy is affordable. Our strategy sets a challenge to the industry to make Scotland the first place in, uh, area in the UK to host subsidy free onshore wind. Cost reductions are real, uh, like those announced today by the Offshore Wind Programme Board, showing offshore wind energy costs have fallen by 32% since 2012. And this is proof that offshore wind is rising to the challenge to reduce its costs, and Scotland can be proud of how we're playing our part and leading the way in marine energy and in the development of floating offshore wind projects off our coastline, a technology that's well suited to our deeper waters. The strategy reiterates our commitment to delivering a stable, managed transition to a low-carbon economy, highlighting a range of technologies and fuels that will supply our energy needs over the coming decades. The strategy makes clear our commitment to the oil and gas industry in Scotland is a key contributor to security and stability of energy supplies throughout our transition, with around three quarters of total energy consumption in Scotland currently being supplied by oil and gas. Production of oil and gas in the North Sea and west of Shetland is highly regulated, with some of the most advanced and comparatively least carbon intensive production methods of their kind anywhere in the world. Our oil and gas sector will continue to make a positive contribution as the engineering and technical bedrock for a wider energy transition.
Advances in technology mean that new and innovative ways of using hydrocarbons are emerging, and they will continue to do so in the decades ahead. Energy sources such as hydrogen, a zero carbon fuel at the point of use, have potential to substantially reduce the total system cost of decarbonisation, providing a range of services to our energy system and integrated low carbon solutions across heat, power and transport sectors. Such innovations are already here. Uh, Aberdeen hosts the largest fleet of hydrogen powered buses in Europe, supported by two hydrogen refuelling stations. At the Leavenmouth Community Energy Project, renewable wind power is being used to run a fleet of hydrogen vehicles, including five council vans and refuse collection vehicles. The strategy makes clear that the Scottish Government is committed to examining the evidence and engaging with the citizens of Scotland to gather their views and understand their needs and perspectives. Presiding officer, our approach to evaluating the impacts of unconventional oil and gas is an example of this evidence-based and measured approach. As I outlined in my statement on 8th of November, we will very shortly launch our full public consultation on unconventional oil and gas so that the people of Scotland can express their views on this important and contentious issue. The results of that consultation will be a key consideration in finalising our energy strategy later this year. Our draft energy strategy confirms our proposal that underground coal gasification will play no part in our energy mix. Presiding officer, our energy strategy is not just about energy supplies. Consumers of energy are at the heart, very heart of our whole system approach and our patterns of energy use are changing too. We're now more efficient than ever in using energy, but major shifts lie ahead. How consumers engage with these energy choices will be informed by smart technologies uh, that provide better information on energy use and a better platform for informed decisions around the consumption of energy. Scotland will need a more flexible energy system which can accommodate the many choices that consumers and generators will make in the future. This energy challenge represents an exciting opportunity to capture economic benefits of pioneering these approaches here in Scotland. Smart and controlled charging of an ever-growing uh, number of electric vehicles in Scotland will itself grow demand for electricity uh, while providing energy storage capacity and ability to absorb intermittent loads from renewable generation and potentially a source of grid power input when required. Most importantly, we recognise energy remains unaffordable for too many in Scotland. This is driven by high energy prices, but our housing and non-domestic building stock, which is all too often profoundly wasteful in energy, is another key driver. Despite our very significant investment in improving the energy efficiency of Scotland's homes, this draft energy strategy seeks to address the needs of those least able to pay for their energy, supporting energy solutions that provide warmer homes and better outcomes for consumers as well. Scotland's Energy Efficiency Programme, SEEP, is a long term programme to improve energy efficiency in both domestic and non domestic buildings with the ultimate aim of decarbonising Scotland's heat supply, making energy more affordable and reducing carbon emissions from our built environment. And we've committed over £500 million to SEEP up to 2020-21. SEEP is currently in its design phase and today we're also publishing two key accompanying consultations in support of the draft Scottish Energy Strategy. The first consultation focuses on options for the programme and policy design of SEEP and the second consults more specifically on the role that regulation could play in supporting the development of district heating in Scotland, as well as a framework for the planning at a local level of heat decarbonisation and energy efficiency programmes. Scotland is now a pioneer in the development of innovative local energy systems. Heat, electricity and storage technologies, combined with demand management and energy efficiency measures on an area-by-area -area basis, could realise substantial local economic, environmental and social benefits. Scotland's communities and island populations are increasingly playing an active and important part in the delivery of local, innovative, low-carbon, smart energy systems in partnership with the private and public sectors. These projects benefit from funding support from the Scottish Government, including the Local Energy Challenge Fund, which has to date allocated £31 million to a wide range of innovative projects. In addition, under the Low Carbon Infrastructure Transition Programme, we've already supported over 40 low carbon projects and today I can announce that around £50 million will soon be awarded to 13 low carbon demonstrator projects at sites across Scotland. These projects are at the cutting edge of innovation and uh, provide a solid basis for our learning as we mainstream a local energy approach. In conclusion, I'm proud to present our draft Scottish Energy Strategy to the Chamber and to launch a consultation exploring the choices we face on our future energy system. I invite members from across the Chamber and all our constituents to have their say on key decisions that will determine the shape of Scotland's energy future. 
I hope that in the months ahead, in finalising our strategy, this document stimulates well-informed debate on the energy challenges in Scotland and the policies needed to meet our aspirations to deliver a secure, sustainable energy future for all, an outcome that I have no doubt uh, will be in the best interests of our communities, our economy and our environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow, allow 20 minutes for questions, after which we must move on to the next item of business. The help of members who want to ask questions, press the request to speak now. Now, and the mantra, as always, is try to make your questions brief, and if the Minister can, brief and succinct as well. I now call on Alexander Burnett, followed by Jackie Bailey. Mr Burnett. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Minister for early sight of his statement? Uh, and before I start, I'd like to note my registered interest regarding renewable energy. Now, I welcome the new targets to push our renewables ambitions even further. And, uh, sorry, since the inception of a CFD programme, Scotland has received 40% of its funding for projects from the UK government, a fact acknowledged by the Scottish government. So it is right that we should be at the forefront of the renewable energy sector. However, the minister will know that the low-hanging fruit has been picked and we now need significant investment in renewable heat and specifically not wasting heat from our homes, a policy which is handled here in Holyrood. However, the current homes insulation budget is already a million pounds behind where we were two years ago, and that is simply not good enough. So the Scottish Conservatives have called for all homes to be EPC rated C or above by 2030, and we've also called for 400 million a year investment by the end of this parliament to reach those renewable targets a policy which is supported by stakeholders such as WWF. So why does the Minister think that his budget of £114 million is sufficient when stakeholders are clearly telling him it is not? Minister? Well, I, I certainly recognise the, the issue of the importance of tackling uh, fuel poverty and improving the energy efficiency of our buildings. I hope we do have common ground on that. Clearly, we have a difference of opinion as to the approach that this, the Scottish Government is taking. I would highlight, though, in, in recent years, I, I know from my previous tenure as Environment Climate Change Minister uh, how much chopping and changing there was in terms of policy around uh, Green Deal and other measures to support energy efficiency. Obviously, that has been cancelled. That had a, a direct impact on the Scottish Government's budget. We have tried to replace the loss of Green Deal funding and therefore putting substantial investment. So it's not a minor matter that £500 million is being invested over the period up to 2021 by the Scottish Government, but it is very much, I just want to reassure the member, part of a longer-term programme going well beyond 2021, and that's uh, certainly why we're launching the consultation and seek to try and elicit views as to how best we can implement uh, the Scotland's energy efficiency programme, which is a national infrastructure priority and therefore a very high priority for this government and a hope for all the whole chamber. So I'm, I'm happy to work with the member and, and his colleagues in, in the Conservatives if they have positive ideas to support how we uh, take forward SEEP uh, with Mr Stewart, the uh, local government uh, minister as well. So happy to engage with uh, Mr Burnett in that, but I would just recognise that the Scottish Government has been putting its money where its mouth is. Uh, there is not an equivalent programme in England at this moment in time. And so we, we feel confident we are making great strides forward. We could always do more, but we are making significant investment in energy efficiency. Jackie Bailey, followed by Kate Forbes. Ms Bailey. Could I declare an interest, presiding officer, as the Vice President of Energy Action Scotland. Can I thank the Minister for an advanced copy of his statement and indeed for much of the content. In particular, I very much welcome the 50% renewable energy target. It was in Labour's manifesto, it was in the SNP's too. It is ambitious and rightly so, but the challenge, of course, will be in implementation and we look forward to examining the detail. While Scotland, more often than not, generates more energy than we use, it is the case that there have been occasions when we require to import energy. Baseload is, of course, a key issue, yet the statement is short on what the government will do to make sure the lights stay on. So what actions will the Scottish Government take to maintain baseload? Does he intend to continue our helpful partnership with the rest of the UK energy market? And secondly, presiding officer, I'm concerned that we measure the effect of what we do on people. Um, so rather than inputs and outputs, I want us to measure outcomes. Will the Scottish Government therefore make sure the focus is on how many people it has lifted out of fuel poverty, not how many houses it has insulated? Minister. 
Um, certainly the latter point, I have some sympathy with what Jackie Bailey says. This is ultimately about trying to help people tackle fuel poverty and I think we're all in agreement it's one of the biggest problems we face with our constituents that we deal with on a regular basis where people are facing uh, making choices between heating their homes and eating. That's clearly not a satisfactory position, far from it. So I do take the point. It's not entirely my decision to say this, but I, I, I have sympathy with the point about trying to focus on how many people we help rather than and actually heating houses for the sake of heating houses. It's, it's, it's about trying to help individuals. So I think it's a very constructive point and I will work with colleagues in the government to see how we can implement that. It's worth stating that we are going to be working with stakeholders to try and identify our approach to tackling fuel poverty, having a renewed uh, strategy for that and also looking at how we actually measure that and, and, and the scope of targets in that respect. So I would hope that there's a possibility to engage with Jackie Bailey and her colleagues on how we take forward that agenda. On, on the flexibility issue, I very much recognise that we have an important need to make sure we have a secure, uh, reliable supply of energy. I, I would continue to want to work with UK government ministers in trying to achieve that end. Uh, I have engaged positively with them on issues like pumped hydro storage, and I know there is an agenda as well on uh, looking at battery storage uh, south of the border. That's a focus of, of industrial strategy as well. So I hope we can work together on that. Um, it does take two to tango, as I've discussed with uh, Ms Bailey, uh, but uh, we, are, we are keen to... <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like an offer. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a, mo a comment, uh, presiding officer, directed at Don't Ms Bailey. Don't keep digging, a, minister. It, it was a reference to, to UK ministers rather than Ms Bailey herself, who, I, who I've always worked very well with. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but we do recognise the need to generate baseload, and, and so therefore it's important that we, we look at um, what we can do uh, around areas like thermal generation as well. There is, there's currently a, an environment, a framework in place which is harmful to establishment of a uh, replacement plant for uh, Kikenzi and, and for, for Lunganet, and uh, there's obviously an existing consent at Kikenzi, but we do want to work with the UK government to create a more a propitious environment for, for that baseload to happen. 14 people trying to get in minister Sorry, so I could never be brief and could I ask the minister with, with respect to try and shorten answers. Kate Forbes be followed by Dean Lockhart. Thank you. Can the minister give further details on how he believes the proposals in this energy strategy will help reduce social inequalities and foster inclusive growth and outline what's been done to ensure individual communities benefit from renewable energy projects? Minister. Thank you, presiding officer. I think um, when we touch, touched on issues to do with fuel poverty, I think there's a particular rural dimension. Uh, I know the cost of living is higher. I know that uh, Highlands Isles Enterprise and, uh, and Joseph Roundtree Foundation have done work in the past to look at the high cost of living in rural areas, and therefore fuel poverty is a particularly acute problem in rural areas, particularly in the island communities of Scotland. I would say that Scotland's consumers, households and businesses are very much at the heart of this strategy, and uh, we are looking for opportunities for consumers and suppliers alike to address in particular impact on fuel, fuel poverty. There will be a renewed focus on energy efficiency. There will be uh, wanting to seek, as a reference to the point made to Ms. Ms. Bailey, uh, an energy market that works for everyone working with UK ministers where we can do that. And we want to create local vibrant uh, energy economies as well across Scotland where we can do that with us, perhaps local arrangements for supply and uh, demand of electricity. But we are, to reiterate the point we've made before, I think, around committed to increasing the scope to work in partnership with host communities where renewable projects are taking place. And I would just cite that we have a, uh, upped our target, upped our game, we met our target for community energy uh, to be generated by 2020, five years early. So we have doubled the target for 2020. That remains a key part of the energy strategy uh, to achieve one gigawatt of community and locally owned energy by 2020. And we have an aspiration for at least half of newly consented uh, in renewable energy projects uh, by 2020 to have an element of shared ownership. So that should also help ensure economic benefits are felt at a local level. Dean Lockhart, followed by Richard Leonard. Thank you. I would uh, note my register of interest in relation to a smart metre company based elsewhere in the UK. The Minister has just an announced yet another delay on a decision on fracking, more than two years after the initial moratorium was introduced. In his statement, he stressed the importance of decarbonisation, and we agree with this. However, is the Minister aware that Scotland is currently importing <coughs> over 40,000 barrels of shale gas every day from the US, an unnecessary 3,000 mile journey, which is resulting in a significantly increased and unnecessary carbon footprint at a time when we could be Question, using, we could be extracting we could be extracting Question. this gas domestically is does he not recognize the huge benefits available for jobs and the economy in Scotland uh, presiding officer, with the greatest respect to Mr Lockhart, I would, I would just say that that's a matter for the people of Scotland to inform us with, through the consultation, which is on track, as promised in our November statement, 
to take place uh, at the end of this month. So, uh, Mr Lockhart will not have long to wait for, for the consultation. I look forward to reading his submission to it. However, I would point out in my statement on underground coal gasification, at the time being heavily criticised by the Conservative benches for taking a decision which was measured and based on evidence, which is our approach rather than the UK Government approach, uh, we were criticised at the time by the Conservative Party in this chamber. And lo and behold, the UK Government has followed Scotland's lead and done exactly the same. So perhaps uh, Mr Lockhart will then listen to our evidential-based approach, uh, listen to the determination we make, and we will bring the matter to Parliament, allow Parliament to vote on the future of unconventional gas in Scotland. Richard Leonard, followed by Richard Lockhead. Uh, meeting these energy transition targets demands leadership political leadership, but if local supply chains are to benefit, and if in turn we are to generate local jobs, it demands economic leadership as well. So can the Minister tell us whether the Government is committed to a plan for the economy to go with this energy strategy uh, so that we maximise the benefits to local manufacturers, local suppliers and to local jobs? Minister. Well, I, I certainly agree with uh, Richard Leonard. One of the key objectives we have as a government, and I'm sure it's, it's obviously shared by Mr Leonard from what he has said, is to try and ensure in making a low carbon transition, we generate local jobs in Scotland. It's part of the implicit deal that was struck in 2009 with trade unions and Civic Scotland that we would make this historic transition to a low carbon economy, but do so in a way which brought people with us and for areas which were high carbon in the economy, help them transition to low carbon. So it's very important that as industry develops in response to the, both the climate change plan and the energy strategy we set out today, we work very hard with industry to make sure that we convert those opportunities into jobs in Scotland. Uh, we have launched an innovation action plan which makes specific reference to low carbon and, and tackling climate change within it. Uh, we have our established uh, manufacturing action plan for Scotland which is not biased as an industrial policy but effectively is uh, a co-component of an industrial policy and we look forward to working with Mr Leonard and others to make sure we can take forward that agenda and secure the vital economic opportunities uh, that we, we hopefully can see come from this strategy. Richard Lockhead, followed by Maurice Golden. Can I warmly welcome the Minister's ambitious strategy, and as you will know, I have been a long-standing supporter of the creation of a publicly owned national energy company in Scotland to ensure our people capture more of the benefits from our natural resources. Can he assure me that work is already underway to create such a publicly owned energy company because if the Danes can do it, the Norwegians can do it, other countries can do it, hopefully we can do the same here in Scotland so that our people don't just the crumbs off the table but get the maximum benefits from our vast energy resources. Minister. Well, I, I very much recognise Presiding Officer uh, Mr Lockhead's uh, commitment to this issue. I remember well having conversations with him in, back in 2014, I think, so as long ago as that, on this very subject. And I know he is very uh, strong on, on this issue. I would want to reassure Mr Lockhead, it might not have been referenced in my statement, but it is very much part of the energy strategy. that We're making, making a commitment to explore uh, the role and remit of a government-owned energy company. So there is a specific question in the consultation which invites views on the potential role for such an organisation. And I certainly look forward to Mr Lockhead's considered uh, contribution to that. We believe it uh, potentially it should address specific market failure issues or it could potentially add value through accelerating progress towards relevant policy aims or goals that are set out in the strategy. It could even take on a number of potential roles in relation to delivery of projects as well. So there's potentially delivery support of existing and new schemes and initiatives that potentially deliver uh, energy infrastructure, including district heating, or to coordinate indeed uh, the procurement of energy efficiency and heat technology measures. It could actually act as an energy supplier or indeed to be administering a Scottish Renewable Energy Bond, which is another question in the, in the energy strategy. On all these issues, we would welcome people's views on the potential role of such an organisation. Morris Golden, be followed by Mark Ruskell. We welcome the consultation on the regulation of district heating, but in light of the fact that less than 1% of homes are currently connected to this district heating, what steps will this government take to develop innovative financial models, such as shared stakeholder investment, in order to increase access to district heating? Minister. Well, I, in fairness, I do recognise Morris Golden's uh, strong interest in this area. He's raised uh, district heating a number of times, so I, I commend him for taking uh, this issue forward. It's something, uh, again, I would hope that we can have common ground on. In terms of what the government is doing, we are uh, on district heating. We're taking forward um, a, a target. We have uh, an ambition to deliver one and a half terawatt hours of Scotland's heat by district or communal, communal heating by 2020. Obviously, as part of the wider strategy out to 2032 to support uh, the, uh, the Environment Secretary's climate change 
change plan. We are looking very much at uh, what more we can do to step that up, and hence the work that the Special Working Group has done to inform the regulatory environment that might make that happen faster and with greater, uh, and securing greater private sector investment is, is very encouraging. And I've also just said that I've had considerable international interest in what we're doing in Scotland. I think Scotland and London are probably the two locations in the UK context that are attracting most interest from a point of district heating projects because we're getting the regulatory uh, position correct and uh, commend the work of my predecessor, Fergus Ewing, in terms of taking that, that work forward as well. Uh, so I picked up, very much tried to pick up the ball from him. Mark Ruskell, followed by Lee MacArthur. Uh, can I congratulate the Scottish Government for rising to the challenge that the Greens set in this chamber last month, the target of half of all our energy to be renewable by 2050. Now the Government must match that with a commitment to keep Scotland frack free. On heat, can I ask the Minister further to his uh, previous answer how he will switch nearly 2 million homes to low carbon heating by 2032, which is clearly going to require more than just district heating. That's the number of homes that will be required to meet the 80% uh, domestic heat target that's in the climate plan you just referred to. Minister. Well, I think it's a fair point that Mark Ruskell makes about the fact we can't just rely on district heating. We don't think every house will have a district heating solution to it, so clearly we have to look at other alternatives. What we are looking at is alternative fuels. Potentially there's a role for areas like hydrogen uh, to replace, but it's not that long ago, it's part of the uh, uh, town gas that was going through the mains in, in a lot of towns in Scotland. It may have a role, but that's a question for the consultation to, to answer. Uh, but we are obviously investing heavily in, in SEEP itself to improve dem uh, demand management for energy, so we reduce people's consumption of energy and, and wasteful loss of heat, uh, which will also help the equation. So trying to reduce demand and, and improve energy efficiency at one level, and also trying to improve the supply of renewable source heat uh, at the other end. Hopefully we can get there, but I welcome uh, potential engagement with Mr. Ruskell and his ideas on how we can take that forward. Liam MacArthur to be followed by Marie Todd. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer, can I make the Chamber aware uh, that I am a uh, owner of a micro turbine? Can I also join others in welcoming the government's acceptance of the demands of Scottish Liberal Democrats and others for a 50% renewables target by 2030? Uh, on transport, how does the Minister um, expect the ambitious 33% target set out by the Cabinet Secretary last week uh, to square with an expectation in his draft strategy that effective biofuel use in transport decarbonisation is unlikely to reach above 10% for some time and does he believe the Scottish Government's approach to uh, business rates will help or hinder efforts to make Scotland the first area in the UK to host subsidy uh, free uh, onshore wind? Minister. Um, there's two issues there. The first one really around um, uh, the decarbonisation of transport is clearly one of the biggest challenges we face as a society and I do accept that not necessarily biofuel, biofuels will not necessarily be the only answer we have to explore here. That's why it's very important there's measures in the energy strategy. I appreciate the member has not yet had a chance to see uh, where we're talking about very much the, de uh, the decarbonisation through electrification as well as hybrid vehicles, potentially hydrogen, which I, I cited in my statement being used in Aberdeen, for example, for bus fleet and indeed in Fife Council. I commend Fife Council for, for using uh, hydrogen in relation to uh, refuse collection vehicles and, and smaller vans and light goods vehicles. So there's a very good pilot work being done. I know in Orkney as well, clearly, um, that uh, the member has mentioned Orkney in the context of being a bit of a living laboratory, and he is right in that respect. Uh, there's very good work being done on hydrogen for use in the ferry fleet, uh, uh, use, taking the advantage of the off-grid nature of, of Orkney at this moment, where there's surplus electricity being generated to create hydrogen for use in transport. So we're looking at all these issues, and we'd welcome feedback from, from industry as to how best we can achieve our goals. Marie Todd, to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, presiding officer. Will the Minister give more detail on how the energy strategy will interact with the climate change plan and offer his thoughts on the news that the UK government's dithering on carbon capture and storage cost the taxpayer £100 million due to the cancellation of its £1 billion CCS competition in which Peter Head was the front runner? Minister. Well, it is a hugely important issue, presiding officer. I don't want to strike a discordant note, but it was, I believe, a pretty disgraceful decision in relation to Peterhead, uh, in that uh, investors were led to believe there was support, and then it was pulled from under them at the last minute. Clearly, we, uh, within our energy strategy, which again, I appreciate members have not had a chance to look through in detail at this stage, we very much do cite the importance of CCS as a, as a technology that, uh, for demonstration in Scotland, we believe near-term demonstration 
uh, of small-scale projects leading to medium and large-scale deployment of CCS, uh, along with the development of CO2 utilisation, which potentially has an economic use itself, will be critical for the cost-effective decarbonisation of heat power and industry. Uh, we are, do regret very strongly the fact that the UK Government withdrew all of the funding for the 1 billion CCS competition. We will try and persuade them of the logic of carrying on with investment in CCS, because we do think it's a very important part of the future energy supply in, in Scotland. And the development of CCS would, of course, protect Scottish businesses against future carbon price rises and secure economic benefit for the supply chain too. So to pick up Mr Leonard's point. So this, this knowledge and expertise could be transferred to international markets as well, where there's growing interest in CCS and indeed allow Scotland to play a leading role in global decarbonisation, if that's possible to do so. Claudia Beamish. Officer, as the Minister said, our climate ambitions must underpin all the choices laid out in the draft energy strategy. So can the Minister explain what synergies there will be between the scrutiny by Parliament of the draft strategy and the draft climate change plan, and what formal assessment is being made to ensure that the, the transition is a just one to the low carbon economy for affected workers and communities? Minister. Well, we, I, I, I recognise a similar point that was made uh, by Claudia Beamish's colleagues, that we do have to take into account the impact on society. We, uh, as part of the, the challenge that all uh, uh, developed economies face in terms of transitioning from a very high carbon model to a low carbon model, that we try and make sure we take people with us and we don't break the economy in the process. So I appreciate sometimes it's going slower than some folk would like, uh, but we have to have the, the leading ambition. Obviously, the targets set the, set the frame and, and allow industry to, to see, the, see the future ahead of them and, and obviously help them migrate over a period of time to a different model. Uh, but I'm happy to engage with the trade unions, with, with others on how we best take that forward. And I'm sure uh, the, the Environment Secretary as well is, is very aware of, of the need to make sure that we uh, take these points on board. But I look forward to engaging with, with Claudia Beamish on the energy aspects of that. That concludes questions. I apologise to five members across the parties I've been unable to call with time. I have to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate, so I'll give a minute for front bench to change places.